Oh, so we are. Um, so this is the 21st webinar that we've had, but and it's our fifth talk because we decided this year that we were going to have a series focused on oil in the C4 um, effort that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math uh, produced. And this is the fifth talk on that series. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey Short and Dr. Kara Smithmore were were key authors of a chapter on oil spill effects. And they're going to describe to us today um, the findings from that chapter and chapter on uh, on the National Academies um, report. So with that, I I uh, we you know we've we've set up this to give about an hour for the speakers. So it's up to you guys on you know taking an hour or so, and uh, then we'll have, have answer questions um, after that. As I said, through the Q and A button. Um, just let me say this next next webinar is next month, same same first Tuesday of the month, I think is the way we do it. And and Dr. Bernie Goldstein will will talk about human health effects and the chapter that he chaired on that for the oil in the sea um, effort. And that may be the final final one uh, that we have from the from the oil in the sea for effort. So with with that, let me uh, let me introduce uh, speakers. Um, we have Dr. Kara Smithamore and we have Dr. Jeffrey Short. I'm not going to give the big bio because I hope they give us a little bit more information about their careers as as they as they speak. Um, I think Dr. Mitchamore is going to go first. She is a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science um, in Maryland. And Dr. Short runs a consulting firm uh, for the time being, at least in, in Alaska, called JWS Consulting. And without any more from me, I'm going to pass it over to, to Dr. Mitchell Moore, and hopefully you can pull up your slides, and uh, and uh, I'll let you take over. You're on mute. All right. You're, you're still on mute, Dr. Mitchell Moore, and your slides. Yes, sorry. I'm just making sure the slides are... Yeah, you're in the, you. you're on the desktop mode. Okay. Yeah. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, that's that's perfect. Thank you. We're ready to go. All right. Great. Well, first of all, thank you everybody uh for your patience in my late arrival there. Um I'm very, very known for technical issues, and uh, that was that was certainly the case today. Um, so, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction, Tim. Um, so, I actually became interested in oil in at the age of five, um, and uh, I stepped in a tar ball in uh, Plymouth, where I'm I'm from in in England, and that had a very lasting effect, having that scraped off me by by my mom. And at that point, I decided I wanted to work in in marine pollution. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a bio there. So as uh, Tim mentioned, I'm a professor and, and uh, the uh, uh, interim director at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. Um, my expertise is in environmental health and toxicology. And uh, I study the effects on fate of chemicals um, on resident or organisms, uh, particularly uh, compounds such as oil, dispersants, and also um, personal care products and uh, currently um, sunscreens. Um, I also conduct toxicity testing and application for risk assessment, regulation, and uh, management activities. Uh, so uh, I am going to um, start with this um, report out. Um, and uh, that is there's presenting on the most recent Oil and Sea uh, 4 uh, report on inputs, fates, and effects of oil uh, in, in the sea. And specifically, we'll be highlighting um, the fight, the conclusions and findings and uh, uh, research recommendations for chapter six, which was uh, effects of oil and the sea. So I first want to um, uh, recognize that this was a um, obviously a, a, an extensive effort um, by a number of people. Um, I won't go over uh, all the all the names here, but this was a a, a extensive committee of of seventeen different uh, members. Obviously, it's a very diverse and uh, also I should point out a very dedicated committee. 
um, for this, this report. And it was led by a number uh, of, of people also at the National Academies, partic particularly the study director, Kelly Ospik. Um, and just a reminder that, you know, this report is available for free download um, from the site um, listed uh, at the bottom. So I just wanted to start um, with uh, what the, the goal of uh, today's presentation is. Uh, we're going to give a little bit of an uh, introduction and, a, and an overview. Um, and specifically focus on discussing, so what's new from oil in the C3? As you know, this is a, you know, the fourth in these series of reports. The oil in the C3 was um, uh, over 20, 20 years ago. And uh, so obviously a lot has happened in the last 20 years. And so there was a lot of um, synthesis and uh, you know, this was a, this was a, a big report um, updating the oil in the C3. Uh, I'm going to, uh, after the introduction, I'm going to hand over to um, my colleague, Jeff, Jeff Short, uh, who's going to talk about uh, a little bit about common misconceptions, modes of exposure, mechanisms of toxicity, um, effects of populations, communities and ecosystems, and uh, effects in the Arctic. I will be uh, also discussing uh, our laboratory testing and uh, effects mo modeling, some of the challenges and limitations. Um, with with those, and the chapter six finishes with um, a very extensive uh, uh, report on uh, the effects in humans, and that is going to be covered in a separate session. Um, it, uh, I hear your next session, and that's by um, Dr. Bernie Goldstein. So, just an outline on uh, on this chapter. You know, this chapter was focused on the effects of oil in the sea. And so the question is, you know, what is new in this oil in the C4 report versus what uh, was in the oil in the C3? Of course, in those 20 year period, there has been, um, you know, since the, since the oil in the three, in, in, in oil in the C3, um, you know, particularly following the deep water horizon, there's been many important advances in our understanding of the effects of oil in the marine in the in the marine environment of course you know time has also helped it has been 20 years since oil in the c3 so in that light there's obviously a lot more time to study you know longer term effects on populations and communities in prior oil spills such as uh, from the exxon valdez um there is a uh, focused um on uh, you know with the with the uh, focus from the the deep water horizon and also you know expanding funding that was available, uh, also coupled with a number of different advances in technology, and that is all the way from um, analytical uh, techno te technologies through the use of molecular and omics tools. We have identified a number of new ways or mechanisms of action in which oil um, in, in, uh, impacts organisms. Um, of course, oil is a complex mixture, and, and uh, that makes determining toxicity inherently difficult. And of course, it's further uh, challenged within the context of changing ecosystems. And uh, so we now have a little bit of an increased understanding on the role that uh, multiple different environmental co-stressors, things like UV light, um, and uh, uh, and temperature, pH, even pressure, you know, how they modify uh, the toxicity of oil. There's also been a number of other advances, um, even changes to our understanding on the effects of oil. And that's described throughout the chapter. For example, um, the, 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 uh, the highlight of, of new exposure routes, um, for example, um, you know, inhalation, uh, exposure at the air sea, um, air sea oil interface. There's also um, a continued thread, and uh, of course, this is what led to the the Crosur protocols 20, thirty odd years ago. This is a continuing thread. You've seen many um, books, chapters, reviews, um, and uh, the, the, even the previous. National Academy report on dispersants that came out a couple of years. This is continued thread in terms of challengings, challenges that relate to the appropriate conduct and interpretation of um, laboratory toxicity tests. 
Um, we have a greater um, understanding of, uh, as I mentioned before, chronic longer term effects on populations and community levels, um, including food webs. And uh, the chapter also discusses, so I have a, I'm by an, an, a naval air base here and they just decided to do some really loud flyover, so I apologize for that. Um, this chapter also discusses new um, affected habitats and, and species such as the Arctic and deep sea cor corals and the many advances that have um, occurred in modeling and predicting uh, the impacts of oil over these past 20 years. Um, one major focus, a new focus, um, was on human health that was largely missing in the oil and the C3. Um, and that includes aspects of socioeconomic, mental and behavioral health. And again, this is not gonna be touched on in this um, presentation. There will be a whole, a whole um, uh, presentation on this next time by Dr. Bernie Goldstein. So with that, I'll pass over to, to Jeff. Um, and Jeff, if you let me know when to advance the slides. Thank you, Karis. And thank you, Tim, for uh, your introduction as well and the opportunity to to make this presentation and uh, thanks to all the participants for uh, listening in. So uh, I started my career in 1972 in oil pollution and doing toxicity testing at the uh, here in a, a fisheries lab in Juneau, Alaska, and stayed with that with a little bit of a hiatus in the early 1980s to get a master's degree in physical chemistry at uh, UC Santa Cruz. <clears throat> With the advent of the Exxon Valdez, uh, our group was immediately drafted into the damage assessment uh, effort for that. Uh, and I played an increasingly large role as that moved forward over the next 20 years, uh, focusing on uh, first overseeing, uh, ultimately overseeing most of the analytical chemistry. Uh, I developed a, a analytical lab uh, at our, our laboratory for hydrocarbon analysis and uh, and then running uh, uh, several studies to uh, evaluate the fate and effects of that spill. Uh, I retired from federal service in uh, 2009 and started a consultancy and uh, was immediately uh, uh, contacted after the advent of the Deepwater Horizon to organize the scientific support for the uh, multi-district litigation uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, British Petroleum in that event. Uh, and I've been active in the field up until recently. I'm, I'm now in the process of retiring. So this will be my, my swan song, I guess. Um, so uh, diving in, um, I, I want to start with uh, pointing out that uh, what, what may be obvious, maybe not, uh, that, that oil spills are very complicated and complex events. And by that, I mean complicated. There are a lot of interacting moving parts and complex in that many of those parts interact nonlinearly. And that makes uh, teasing out these effects uh, really challenging. Uh, they're complicated by multiple stress co-stressors, as well as the stressors of a, of a spill that range from the individual level to the ecosystem level. Uh, and so, and there's a lot of, while there's a lot of laboratory uh, work that's done at the individual level, concern increases once you get to population and higher level effects uh, as, as a result of a spill. Uh, and I'm, I'm reminded by uh, a comment that uh, Merv Fingus, uh, a towering figure in this field made decades ago uh, at an AMOP meeting. And that was that he was uh, lamenting the fact that after every major spill, uh, there's a rush of new uh, entrants into the field to deal with the, uh, <clears throat> the the new effects in the new region that's affected. Uh, they have almost no time to read the literature, and they end up reinventing the wheel after uh, on several fronts after every major spill, and necessarily bring uh, assumptions with them to how they go about prosecuting those studies. And this often inc includes. Uh, uh, misconceptions. So if I could have the next slide, I'll just give you an example of three common misconceptions that people have I've noticed over the years uh, with regard to oil spill. The first one being that oil spills routinely ma cause mass fish kills. There are rarely some oil spills that have caused mass fish kills, but I emphasize they are rare. Over and over and over again in a generic spill or typical spill, uh, fish kills are sort of the thing that keeps not happening. And um, there are really good reasons for that, which I'll get into in a moment. Uh, second one is that uh, 
the assumption that, well, fish and marine mammals and perhaps other organisms will uh, routinely avoid oil contaminated waters. There's actually very little evidence to support that. A third one is that oil will uh, sink to the seafloor and contaminate the uh, you know, benthic organisms there. And while that happened in the deep water horizon, uh, it was largely the result of the fact that the injection of the oil most uh, occurred at the seafloor itself and that contaminated a large area. In most spills, there are processes such as marine snow formation that will carry some oil to the bottom, but compared to the amount of oil that is initially discharged at the surface, it's small. Uh, so can I get the next slide? So a really new thing that we did uh, in oil in the sea was to um, prioritize effects, both in terms of habitats affected, uh, modes of exposure, and species vulnerability within modes of exposure and within particular habitats. And this cartoon uh, that you're seeing is our attempt to summarize all of that prioritization in a single figure. So it's a pretty complicated uh, actual, actually cartoon that I want, I want to spend a little bit of time walking you through. Um, so the, the <clears throat> modes of the habitats depicted here include the uh, sea surface, the shoreline and the water column uh, and the air. Uh, and the um, modes of exposure include physical contact, ingestion, inhalation and absorption. The colors are meant to indicate that of these four modes, physical contact is the one that in a generic spill, at least a typical spill of oil entering the sea surface and spreading and then uh, going on to have secondary contamination of other habitats. Um, physical contact is the one that is most likely to cause mass mortalities or, uh, on, a, on, a great, on a large visible scale. Ingestion is the second most dangerous, I would say, uh, uh, mode of exposure. Inhalation being the third and absorption of toxic components, the fourth. Within each of these, um, the um, habitats that are most at risk uh, include the uh, shoreline and the sea surface with the uh, water column and the sea floor uh, at much less inherent risk. And that's inherent in the sense that if you think about this in terms of dimensionality, and by dimensionality, what I mean is if you have a typical sea, uh, oil spill that contaminates the sea surface and say there's wind that blows the uh, oil ashore onto a shoreline, when it gets to the shoreline, most of the oil is confined to uh, one dimension along the shoreline uh, well, itself. And that causes uh, often uh, a huge accumulation of oil that then causes a lot of damage to the, the uh, organized organisms inhabiting that shoreline and, and also promotes persistence. On the sea surface, you have two dimensions. And so the intensity of oiling tends to be less per unit area because you've got more degrees of freedom for it to spread in. But nonetheless, animals that are at uh, transit the inter air seed interface are also typically at great risk. <clears throat> uh, after that, in the water column, you've got three dimensions, and that makes it difficult for toxic common uh, concentrations to be attained. It's not to say that they can't, but it's difficult. Um, and there's two ways that you can get oil into the water column itself. It can be uh, dissolved or it can be dispersed as oil micro droplets in case they're breaking waves. And, and then that leaves, leads to two different ways for uh, uh, animals to become exposed. <clears throat> One is through absorption and the other is through ingestion. And then there's the seafloor, which being two dimensions could accumulate higher, uh, higher loads in theory, but it has to get there through falling through the water column. So that, that also tends to attenuate the effects. So in this cartoon, if you look at physical contact, um, the animals most at risk are depicted at relative risk are depicted by their indicated by their size, and that indicates uh, here uh, seabirds, marine mammals, turtles, and then anything that's on the shoreline in the intertidal. If if case oil comes ashore, 
uh, is also at great risk uh, of encountering very high oil concentrations. Um, and so down at the bottom, there's that little cartoon that says with turtles and it says relative risk uh, on it. And that's what that's intended to indicate. So, so for example, corals are at relatively high risk from absorbing uh, toxic components, uh, whereas they're at much less risk uh, of physical contact. So can I get the next slide? So within the four uh, main uh, modes of uh, exposure, um, there's a number of different, I think 18 uh, distinct uh, mechanisms of toxicity that have been identified. Uh, and, and these vary also with the uh, species that are most at risk, as I just mentioned. So with physical contact, for example, um, the way it kills is by impairing mobility, leading to starvation of seabirds or, or marine mammals, uh, impaired thermoregulation, uh, dermal irritation, and asphyxiation. All these things uh, can and, and have been observed to uh, uh, lead to more you know, direct mortality of populations. The, the next one, ingestion, uh, is where species you know, eat oil, essentially, through one route or another. Uh, there's a bunch of adverse things that can occur as a result of that. And I, I won't go through them all, but uh, you, you can see them there. Uh, and then with inhalation, uh, narco narcosis is a, a big one for marine mammals because many of them are explosive breathers. They'll come up and surface through an oil so that can remember marine mammals don't, aren't necessarily that great at avoiding them. And when they explosively inhale, um, they take a huge load, they can take a huge load of uh, uh, hydrocarbon vapors and then uh, it puts them to sleep and then they drown, for example. Uh, the least, um, in a relative sense, and generally speaking, uh, dangerous route of exposure is absorption. And again, that's because it's so hard to get uh, hydrocarbons to, insult, to dissolve in water. Uh, you know, the old adage, oil and water don't really mix too well, uh, it comes to bear there. With one exception, and that's photo-enhanced toxicity. Uh, and this is something that was came out of the Deepwater Horizon in a big way, uh, where a lot of work was done uh, demonstrating that under strong sunlight, you could get uh, uh, photo, photo oxidized products of oil components that then could dissolve in the water. And that remains a very active field of uh, research interest now, because there's not a lot known about that. But other things that can occur as so-called short-term or acute toxicity, which uh, is what most people think will happen and cause massive fish gills, but that's hard to bring about. Uh, embryotoxic uh, cardiovascular impairment is something that was discovered during the uh, Exxon Valdez aftermath and has come to play a larger role because the uh, concentrations involved that will elicit a, a adverse effects are so low. Uh, but then there, there's also an immune system impairment and behavioral effects that absorption can occur and it stimulate. So can I get the next slide? And I, I guess, yeah, we'll, I'll uh, hand that back to you, uh, Karis. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, so uh, as, uh, for those of you that have read the report, it's, it's uh, pretty extensive in terms of um, there's a lot of details on these particular, um, you know, the, the findings and, and the new research that's come out in the last 20 years. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of, um, you know, high level points and, and, and main items from that from that chapter. One of them um, uh, is first in terms of exposure routes. Uh, so coming out of the, the, the deep water horizon, there was a uh, there was a lot more recognition on the potential um, understudied route of exposure that was at the um, air, uh, at the um, air oil sea interface in terms of the inhalation pathway. And so this is the figure that is in the report and uh, it's specifically focused on dolphins. But I just point out that this is, you know, this inhalation pathway is relevant to, of course, any um, 
surface breathing um, organisms. So, you know, turtles, uh, marine mammals. Um, and uh, so this is a relatively understudied um, pathway, for, for example, in, in turtles. There's, there's no um, research on this. Um, and this was highlighted from the, the dolphin data from the deep water horizon. Um, and this is uh, this depiction um, shows that shows the issue here where, um, you know, oil consi constituents can be in inhaled or aspired through um, the blowhole. They can enter the dolphin's lungs and cause direct injury. They can further um, also enter the circulatory system through pulmonary circulation, travel to the heart and have impacts um, to the cardiovascular system. They can also enter the arterial circulation and travel through the entire body and, of course, reach in a whole array of, site of um, sites of action um, where they may elicit effects, anything from, um, you know, molecular through biochemical to chemical changes to, to normal homeostasis, through um, hormone pathways, through cause DNA damage, you know, a whole array of um, impacts uh, could occur because of the, the, this new um, uh, understudied exposure route. Um, in terms of understudied effects and, and, and species, as Jeff just highlighted, um, the importance of, of the immune system and the feedback of that on overall health of organisms was also um, highlighted in the report. Um, and then also, uh, this was uh, also work that came out of the, um, the, the dolphins and also some work with um, turtles on the involvement of the um, HPA axis. And uh, this is uh, uh, this this has been um, demonstrated and, and shown in a, in a number of species, and of course can have um, ramifications in um, normal homeostasis and, and the endocrine system. Another relatively understudied um, effects is uh, on behavioral effects, um, and uh, another one, and this this came out of uh, you know the use of omics and uh, microbial tools. But understanding the importance of the microbiome, and uh, so some of the uh, effects of the oil could be related, um, not a direct impact of the oil per se on that organism, but an impact to the organism's microbiome, and uh, then subsequently having uh, detrimental effects to to the organism. So those are that's a summary of some of the um, main effects that were highlighted in the report. Um, and then in terms of different species, of course, following the, the deep water horizon, you know, the focus on the deep, deep sea environment, and particularly um, deep sea um, coral species. And so I know there's probably many of you who have heard this over and over again in terms of you know, the number of limitations and challenges um, in toxicity testing that is uh, conducted. Uh, to, to look at the impacts of oil and its constituents and remediation and response options um, by conducting you know, laboratory toxicity tests and uh, uh, looking at impacts and then trying to relate that to um, uh, you know, ecological um, and oil spill relevant effects. And so interestingly, uh, I was on uh, two National Academy reports uh, the, last, the last couple of years is this this one, the oil in the C4, um, but also one that also came out at a similar time, which was the review of the fade effect uh, exposure and effects of sunscreens in aquatic environments and implications of sunscreen use to human health. And it's really interesting in comparing these two uh, reports, there are very, very clear similarities in terms of exactly these addressing these limitations and challenges in toxicity testing. Um, so the, they both um, highlight that you know, there's huge implications in terms of how we translate the data um, and what that data means coming out of toxicity tests, simply because of the variability in the design of toxicity tests, how they're executed, and also how they're reported. Um, you know, the age-old nominal versus measured um, issue um, which is um, incredibly challenging for any organic um, contaminant, um, particularly for complex mixtures uh, such as oil. Um, 
it's recognized that the standardization, standardization and analytical toxicological methods is critical. Um, the how these tests are conducted and um, how they're executed and reported can challenge the utility of the taste de data um, in terms of its relevance and, and reliability and even use in, for example, toxicity test models and in you know, understanding what the um, real field and ecological um, ramifications of these, um, th these um, exposures are. Um, it also complicates interpretations and comparisons between studies. Um, and uh, the verification of the test exposure concentrations are, are essential. And of course, it's a little bit more complicated that, than that, as you'll see when we talk about well, what type of uh, chemicals should be, should be measured and even um, you know, what uh, form in terms of dissolved versus particulates. And of course, throughout the last 20 years, um, there's been the continued development of new technologies, you know, new analytical tools and ways and approaches to look at you know, what the exposure is um, for organisms in terms of the chemical constituents, you know, not just the parent pH, but the alkylated versions, um, all sorts of um, metabolites, um, looking at uh, doing a, a, you know, a deeper dive into exposure in terms of the, the actual exposure form and root and dissolved versus particulate, and then taking those particulates and uh, the oil droplets and looking at their, you know, the numbers and size um, of, of those as well. So there was also been a number of you know, different approaches that built on the um, original CROSERF procedures um, for, for preparing water accommodating fractions and uh, chemically enhanced water accommodating accommodated fractions. So new methods such as those that 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 um, uh, that produce HEWAFs, which are the high energy water accommodated accommodated fractions. Those were the oil and water that put in a blender. Um, and uh, then there was also the um, medium energy water accommodated fractions. So instead of having uh, no vortex for the water accommodated fractions, these were uh, ones that actually use that 25% um, vortex speed that was uh, common for, for making the um, CWAFs, the chemically enhanced water accommodated fractions. So, you know, there's been a lot of uh, attention in terms of, you know, best practices for conducting these um, and how they're um, translated and used and, uh, you know, the um, and putting them in, into the context of environmentally relevant um, concentrations and um, spill scenarios. As I mentioned, there's also been a focus on new habitats and species under threats. Um, you know, when we're conducting toxicity tests, again, this was seen in both of these reports, you know, there is a limited choice of standard toxicity test species, um, especially for marine environmental risk assessments. And so there was the, the need to develop um, standard toxicity test methods for additional species. And of course, in the last 20 years, there's also been the, um, you know, the uh, development of the uh, non-animal models. So this is uh, just an overview, just a hypothetical example demonstrating the critical importance of analytical um, methods. So although we're talking about um, effects here, you know, we the underlining what our effects thresholds are and knowing what they actually mean, there's a critical importance to having very good analytical um, measurements to to um, to to go along with that. So this is just a, a very you know very this is just for a generic chemical for example a, a, an example an example of where you know the age old where nominal is really not acceptable um, particularly for oil spill um, research but really for any um, chemical contaminant that you're looking at the toxicity of you know nominal concentrations concentrations versus measured and appropriate I should say also appropriately measured analytical um, measures, you know, the, the, there's, there's a lot that goes into that in terms of, you know, appropriate ways to establish an average concentration over time and something that is relevant to um, field exposures. So here's just a, I won't go too long in this, but this is a very, you know, quick example. You know, if you, if you have your nominal concentration, but, you know, you've added the stock higher than it should be, 
So um, your, your nominal is nine, your measured is 20. Well, if you reported that based on your nominal, it will be classified as uh, moderately toxic. If you did it based on your actual, it would be classified as um, slightly toxic. So it's just an example of, you know, if you use nominal, it overestimates, uh, overestimates toxicity. Um, and then the flip could happen as well. If you didn't have your stock concentration, it was too lower, then that could result in underestimations. You know, there's also that a lot goes on when you add chemicals to a, uh, a chamber for exposure. Um, you know, you can have things stick to the side and they become actually unavailable. And so in that scenario, that would also that would actually underestimate toxicity. And then further on during. Uh, so even when you collect your sample for analytical, you can have all sorts of losses throughout the um, throughout the um, analytical processing. And uh, if you don't account for those, then that can also overestimate toxicity. So just pointing out that this is a, a more simplified figure than the one that's in oil in C4. So this is not a figure that's actually in um, the report. I'll show you the, the more complicated one, but I just wanted to, to bring you in on this in terms of how the, the um, analytical is conducted or not can have severe implications in terms of over or underestimations of toxicity. You know, these analytical measurements are really key for accurate toxicity thresholds. So this is the, the figure that was in the report. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's talking about you know, the same sort of things in terms of how you can over or underestimate um, based on whether you're using nominal or measured um, concentrations. And uh, of course, for oil, you know, oil, as, as we all know, is complex mixtures, um, and it also can exist in both the dissolved and the particulate forms. And so this is um, also an example where you can get a misinterpretation of toxicity data um, if you use total pH or TPH quantitation in a species where acute toxicity is via narcosis mechanism of action related to the presence of dissolved PAHs. So um, whether you report in terms of the actual um, uh, actual concentration or the dissolved concentration, as you can see depicted here, you would get um, different toxicity thresholds. The other thing is that it's not depicted here is droplet size um, can also be um, key for um, toxicity mechanisms. And I'm not going to go over these, but just to point point out that these are also in the report because you know of this. Um, uh, of, of the uh, scenario um, in terms of how these uh, oil solutions are made up in terms of oil and water, um, so the water accommodated fractions, and whether you use the variable loading versus the variable dilution method. I know this has been discussed to length over the last 30 years. Um, and uh, you know this is just describing the, the, the pros and cons and nuances with both of those um, methods there. And similarly, also in, in the report, and you can refer to the report, this is a, a lot too complicated to, to go through now, but looking at this also from um, you know, the oil, the dispersant and, and, and the water preparations and considerations when you're, um, you know, what do these exposures um, look like and um, the analytical um, verification that goes along with it in terms of, you know, what are the exposure, what is the exposure to the dissolved components versus the particulate components? And how does your preparation method, you know, potentially change um, those uh, constituents uh, within those exposure solutions? So as uh, we mentioned in the introduction, um, a lot of technological advances um, in both analytical um, measurements and also in biological measurements, particularly the use of omics um, in oil spills. And so this is a, a summary figure in the report, you know, talking about um, the advance, the use of genomics and epigenomics, um, transcriptomics, proteomics, um, metabolomics, and how they've all been used um, in uh, the oil spill. So they've allowed us to advance the state of the knowledge of effects in terms of identifying new oil degrading bacteria, for example, looking at specifically at microbial, microbial communities and their, their relationship and metabolic pathways, um, looking at new mechanisms of action and using them to confirm traditional mechanisms of action, also looking at long-term consequences and epigenetics um, of uh, you know, the impact of oil spills to, to um, populations after the oil spill, so they're not directly exposed themselves, but this epigenetic 
um, mechanism uh, having an impact on them. Of course, you know, responses in terms of the transcriptome and that, that relatively new field in terms of, you know, understanding changes to the microbiome um, is critical for organism health. Of course, um, also new technologies have been the non-animal approach models. And I should just point out that, you know, a number of these, um, they've been incredibly useful. Some of them still require further development with um, respect to um, how they fit to uh, adverse outcome pathways and population level consequences. There's also been um, explosion in, uh, in the last 20 years in the predictive models and uh, approaches to, to predict and um, uh, to look at uh, tox uh, effects. Um, many new models have evolved. Um, many have uh, uh, many have um, come online. Many have evolved, and there are now a lot of advanced models at multiple scales and levels of complexity. You know, looking at things like mixture-based approaches. They can also um, some of them are also being used to include changing environmental variables within those as well. So, a couple of examples: the interspecies correlation estimation or ACE methods. Um, these allow predictions for non-standard and, and new species. And then also um, the hazard concentration and species sensitivity distributions, as you can see on the right there, in terms of the, the, the NOAA um, CAFE models. So with that, I will turn back to um, Jeff. Thanks, Garris. So uh, I'm going to uh, briefly cover uh, what's in the report regarding population and community effects. And, and then I'll talk about the Arctic a little bit, uh, uh, the problems of teasing out population and community effects with respect to natural variability and then uh, long-term effects. And so starting with population and community effects, um, these are really hard to detect, but they're of great concern and do a lot of damage when they occur. One that um, for which there was some evidence uh, that, that came out of the deep water horizon, uh, recognizing that, that these are all but impossible to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, was a, a cascading effect caused by mass initial mass mortality of seabirds uh, that, that occurred uh, from just simple contact of these seabirds uh, getting oiled when they land on the oiled, oiled sea surface. Um, that killed hundreds of thousands of birds over a very wide area in the impact area of the deep water horizon. Uh, essentially, in some places uh, like Bar Barataria Bay, um, extirpating them uh, temporarily. The loss of those seabirds, it turns out, uh, they eat a lot of fish, uh, particularly Gulf Menhaden. And it was we were fortunate uh, in the in the deep water horizon that. There was a, uh, this is a, a large, the second largest commercial fishery for fish in the United States, and it's been going on for, for many decades. Uh, and so there is a, a lot of monitoring data for the population uh, to work with. Uh, and there was uh, all of the data fit with this picture uh, that was available that I could find. Uh, the seabirds reduced predation pressure on uh, juvenile menhaden. Uh, that reduced uh, grazing pressure on their food supply, uh, zooplankton uh, and, and phyto, uh, phytoplankton. Uh, as a result, uh, the uh, menhaden numbers increased dramatically. Uh, their food supply uh, was by inference depressed. And um, that uh, provided a, a means for um, knock-on effects that, that were... Uh, not pursued because this was discovered after the fact. And so, it, but it also opened the door to what to look for in the next oil spill. This is, a trophic, this is kind of a trophic cascade effect of, uh, of the deep water horizon. Uh, looking back towards the Exxon Valdez, this may be a mechanism that might have contributed to the uh, herring uh, collapse from which the, that population has yet to uh, recover. So this is um, one of the very few examples of an ecosystem effect or community level effect uh, of, uh, of that an oil, a large oil spill can have on on the uh, on the ecosystem. Can I get the next slide? So in the Arctic, uh, the the uh, oil in the sea for the first time. Uh, 
devoted attention to uh, oil issues unique to the Arctic. And this cartoon uh, depicts uh, some of the unique things that can happen in the Arctic um, with respect to oil, oil contamination. And that's uh, the interaction between oil and ice. Um, there's um, a number of processes that can cause oil to become either entrapped in, uh, in frazzled pores in the ice or trapped between ice uh, in ice uh, where, where there's dense ice flows. Uh, when oil gets trapped in these, uh, in these brine channels, it can stay there for a long time and the ice moves around quite a lot. And so it can transport ice uh, large distances, hundreds of kilometers over the course of a winter. And then if the ice melts again, you can re release the oil and you have what might be uh, a new mystery spill uh, at a remote location from the initial release. Um, the animals that are, again, most, most uh, vulnerable to uh, uh, <clears throat> this kind of contamination are uh, marine mammals, typically, and, and seabirds. Uh, and that's because the oil, when oil gets herded into uh, breathing holes, then obviously anything that either pops up or sticks its head down through that hole is, is uh, vulnerable to uh, contamination, surface contact contamination. <clears throat> and then that can uh, impair the uh, uh, ability to thermoregulate uh, or, or in the case of seabirds to move. And so uh, that can, uh, and it can also present an inhalation hazard. So those are some of the processes that are kind of unique to the Arctic that uh, we address in, in the report. In addition to uh, the uh, very uh, severe vulnerabilities of, of humans in the Arctic that Bernie, I'm sure, will address regarding their uh, uh, subsistence reliance uh, and, and contamination of their subsistence food supply, but that'll be something that he addresses. Can I get the next slide? So as I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, uh, natural variability is a huge challenge to de clearly detecting population and higher level uh, effects. Uh, and in, in our report, we uh, summarize the, uh, this, re this record of observations that extends for more than 30 years now uh, on Mearns Rock in Prince William Sound. Uh, this record started in 1990 when Alan Mearns uh, noticed this one rock in Snug Harbor there, and he just documented the percent cover of uh, rock, uh, rockweed or fucus uh, mussels and barnacles. And over the years, he tracked how that percent cover varied. And as you can see, the variability of those communities is enormous. And so, for example, in 1995, if you had an oil spill in Snug Harbor in 1994, you might conclude that it caused a collapse in the mussel population. But, but actually, um, they're ephemeral uh, over cross years <laughs> on that rock, and uh, usually they're hardly there at all. Um, so, having this brings up the the, the uh, necessity of having clear baselines. Uh, to refer to when you're studying uh, effects of an oil spill, especially a large one. Uh, and then also having a way to account for just the natural processes that are going on that are affecting the, co the uh, system you're looking at at the same time. Next slide, please, Karis. So lastly, I wanna to just touch on uh, uh, oil persistence and chronic effects. Um, this slide shows, the, the cartoon on the right shows uh, studies that have been done on uh, persistence of uh, oil and recovery times in marshes uh, for a number of spills uh, across the world. Uh, and while some recover within a period of one to a few years, uh, if oil gets into uh, the uh, uh, interstices of, of a marsh, and particularly if it gets into uh, a hypoxic part of the marsh. Uh, low oxygen concentration uh, now is, is, has been found to uh, really impede the uh, natural biodegradation of oil. And so when oil gets into a hypoxic environment, such as uh, uh, marsh sediments uh, can often be, uh, it can last a really long time uh, over multiple decades. And then that, that provides a reservoir for long-term exposures 
of animals that either um, inhabit that marsh or disturb it. Next slide. Uh, another example of that is um, <clears throat> this, this slide from the, the Nancy Rabelais put together uh, that depicts uh, the uh, relationship between benthic in fauna and uh, 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 ox uh, hypoxic sediments. Uh, and uh, in the deep water or in the Exxon Valdez, uh, it was found that, that uh, oil often uh, contaminated beaches and then uh, it, as at, at higher tides. And then as the tide went out, these beaches would dehydrate and uh, oil would percolate down into the interstices of the sediments. And on a rising tide, capillary forces would trap it there and it would not go, uh, wash it away again. And then it would be there for a long time, like, again, on the order of decades. Uh, uh, in, in, in the case of many places in Prince William Sound, some places in Prince William Sound. Uh, and when it gets there, uh, if it's in, hypo in a hypoxic uh, part of the sediments, um, the biological processes to degrade the oil uh, become much, much slower. And then uh, that not only limits uh, the habitable area for benthic in fauna, uh, it also presents a, a, uh, an exposure hazard if they venture too far deep into the sediments. And it also presents an exposure hazard for things like sea otters that, uh, or, or sea, uh, some sea stars that uh, excavate sediments and search for prey. And they can liberate the oil in the process of that excavation. So this is something that can cause uh, a way for oil to continue to expose animals for decades. And with, with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Karis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, finish with a few summary slides. Um, the, the report highlighted a, a, you know, a number of challenges. Um, and one of those we already touched on earlier in terms of the influence of the changing environment and also co-stresses. Uh, so as Jeff already mentioned, um, in recent years, there's been a lot of emphasis on photo oxidation products and the toxicity of those products um, to organisms. And of course, for and, and we still have um, the, the issue that's, that was um, highlighted in a number of decades ago in terms of um, has some of the oil constituents um, have photo enhanced toxicity uh, mechanisms as depicted on the um, figure on the right. Um, we also have to look at these spills through the lens of a number of different things in terms of climate change implications, for example, you know, how, uh, how changing temperature, changing pH um, can have influences also on uh, the effects of these um, oil spills. And as, and as previously uh, highlighted by Jeff, you know, changing baselines. Um, so when we're looking at long term uh, recovery and impacts of oil in the environment, you know, the, 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 we have to be cognizant of that, that, you know, the initial baseline data um, and baseline um, health of the organisms and the ecosystem, it could be changing, it could be changing over that time span and to, you know, it makes it incredibly challenging to tease out the differences between natural variation and the changing environment and an impact from the oil spill. And then, of course, there's the combinations. You know, we 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 don't live in a single spill uh, uh, in environment. There's a lot of other physical, chemical, and biological stresses um, that also could um, either interact with, um, could make worse, could um, negate even. Um, you know, a lot of different interactions with other different co-stresses. So. Finishing up with the um, conclusion, so each chapter in, in the report um, highlighted the, the findings and conclusions and the research needs. Um, because there are a lot of um, similarities and nuances between all of the different chapters, chapter seven was devoted to actually the recommendations. Um, rather than having you know, the same recommendations or similar recommendations dotted from each of the chapters, this was combined in that chapter chapter seven. So I encourage everybody to, to look at that. So in terms of some of the, um, you know, similar to, to, to all the other chapters, you know, finish this chapter with findings and conclusions. Again, these feed into those recommendations in, in chapter to seven. 
We also include in the effects chapter a table of the research needs um, that we highlighted to better understand or predict or minimize the effects of oil and marine um, in, in environment. Um, so one of the points um, was to you know, the, the evolving baseline knowledge and, and data and to really do you know, a, a much better job at data mining um, and synthesizing data that is already out there. Um, you know, we have numerous and diverse sources of data and knowledge um, that could feed into this baseline data set that is often underutilized. And of course, with the advantages, advantage that we're having in AI technology, this could be particularly um, useful. Um, also to the uh, addressing the, the collection of new data before um, spill events and the recognition that we do have potentially changing baseline conditions that are important when you're looking at long-term effects. Another conclusion was the requirement for a rapid scientific response, communication and coordination, you know, during and after an oil spill, you know, reductions in the time for scientific engagement in the field um, so that we can prevent missed opportunities, that, to assess critical issues, particularly in terms of baseline data and determining initial impacts. And this would require you know, rapid decision-making, funding and deployment of sciences. Uh, scientists, sorry. Um, the other thing was um, the 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 the, the uh, need for you know continued communication. I mean, and uh, an example highlighted here was it, with natural seeps. Seeps just to you know remind um, uh, and highlight to the to to the public that not oil all effects of oil in the sea are negative. Um, and you know these these flourishing um ecosystems around e natural seeps and what they can tell us and what we can use those for um, is, is just an example um, there needs to be continued efforts and focused research um, to further our understanding in a number of uh, areas such as the need to develop um, techniques for example in you know real-time um, in situ assessments um, center development for, for ph detection in situ image analysis of, uh, for example, phytoplankton, zooplankton in um, water column, the use of um, automated under, underwater vehicles as well, expand on that. Um, and then also conduct studies to fully understand the effects of new oil types, such as the um, low sulfur fuel oils and uh, diluted bitumens. Um, and uh, the, the new routes of uh, potential of exposure, so the marine oil snow, um, that inhalation at the air-sea interface, again, looking at photo oxidation products and uh, combined with photo-enhanced toxicity mechanisms, looking at new mechanisms of action that have been identified, um, the adrenal system, immune response, behavior, and also the microbiome and how that relates to overall health. Um, and uh, again, you know, the new omics technologies are continually advancing um, and are particularly in, in combination with AI now to even push these even further. In terms of uh, toxicity studies and models, um, you know, models are pretty well developed for water column and, and, and acute toxicity, um, but there's been many new methods and approaches since Order C3. Um, and, uh, you know, just to highlight that we still have many toxicity studies that are conducted or reported in ways that misinterpret and mi misrepresent um, implications and or an, are an unusable in um, predictive models. Um, there is uh, increasing evidence, as um, Jeff just showed, of, of significant longer term effects, whether that's a direct or indirect um, exposure and also the uh, epigenetic effects. And the highlight of the protection of the key, of key food web components, endangered species and habitats. Uh, you know, there can be a number of repercussions via trophic linkages um, and focus on corals, including the deep sea and, and non-tropical um, northern species, uh, marshy ecosystems um, and additional health, measured need, health measures needed to assess those. And as Jess um, talked about, um, Arctic um, habitats. Um, so the... Um, it, it, this, this just summarizes the future research needs building on all those findings and conclusions from the report. Um, you know, we need, again, those real-time in-situ assessment techniques, field, even conducting potentially field experiments, 
You know, there's the new oil types of fuels um, to investigate in a lot more detailed, focus on those habitats and species, natural seeps, Arctic deep sea species, such as corals, um, understudied exposure routes, that AFC interface, um, understudied effects such as behavioral trophic interactions and food webs. Again, an emphasis on understanding further the influence of co-stressors in terms of bioaccumulation and toxicity um, and enhancing the guidelines um, and uh, developments in toxicity studies and future modeling efforts. Um, and then the last two uh, were part of text, chapter six, but will be addressed in the next um, uh, session by Dr. Bernie Goldstein. So that was a, a, a summary of chapter six. I did just want to end by finishing up with a couple of the highlights from that from that chapter seven. You know, chapter seven is where all of the report from the the input, fate, and effects and response um, chapters fitted in to provide some much more, you know, higher level, bigger picture um, recommendations from the report. Um, and the one, the first one, as we already mentioned, that need for um, baseline data. And um, so, you know, after an oil spill has occurred, assessment and research efforts often do not have the appropriate or um, requisite pre-spill data um, for comparison with post-spill observations. Um, and you know assessments of remediation. This limits the ability to assess the input fakes and effects of oil, oil on the sea. Of course, you know we can't measure everything all, all, all the time. Um, but the committee recommended you know a review uh, be conducted on how pertinent knowledge and data from numerous sources can be most effectively assembled, made available, and archived. You know given the advances um, and gaps in understanding noted in this report. And again, this is you know further exemplified right now with you know the the, the, the uh, advances in, in in IA technology. So you know this review could look at what's needed for baseline knowledge, the recognition that both natural and anthropogenic influences uh, result uh, the baselines that are dynamic in both space and time. Um, funding should be established to, um, you know, establishes appropriate baseline beta, data and also curate it, um, particularly in locations of particular interest, such as coastal areas with, you know, offshore energy exploration and, and production um, or, you know, common marine um, transportation routes. Um, and, uh, you know, in, a, in a, uh, you know, there should be guidelines set, set for developing these. And in the midst of the spill, you know, make sure that, you know, neighboring unaffected um, control areas could be also assessed where, where also possible. And so then just, just finishing up here, you know, we have enormous streams of data um, that have been generated from, um, you know, advances in analytical techniques um, and also in the biological side of things on the omics. You know, how do these get archived and, you know, how is this big data maintained to make it universally accessible, reliable and also relevant um, to, to, to support this, you know, big interdisciplinary linkage um, between uh, in, in, in oil in terms of the fate and effects of oil in the environment and, and how to inform um, response. And again, this is where now, you know, AI technologies can be particularly um, useful. So the recommendation was to have a you know a free central universe, universally accessible curated um, repository for these um, you know enormous data set. So with that, I would like to finish by again uh, recognizing the uh, entire committee, particularly those um, that were very focused on this chapter, chapter six, um, Ed, Ed, Ed Levine um, and uh, Bernie Goldstein, Nancy Rabelais. Um, and uh, Michael Sicardi, Sicardi um, and every one of the committee members that also um, fed into, into this chapter. And also the uh, National Academy staff um, who uh, you know, worked also tirelessly on this and uh, really helped move, the, move this uh, along. Uh, Kelly Oswig, um, Megan Kenzer, and um, also Grace uh, for the National Academy staff. And again, this report is, is available, freely available for download. And uh, so for that, you know, thank you for attending. And uh, with that, we'll take questions. All right, well, great. Thank you, Dr. Mitchamar. Thank you, um, Dr. Short. We do have some 
time. Traditionally, we stay till half past the hour. Um, I, I'm assuming both of you are going to be able to stay for another 15 minutes and answer questions. Is that going to work out? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, as questions come in, I see we got one, and I always take the initiative here and, and start things off. I want to say first that I, I believe this effects chapter is the most important chapter from my perspective in the book because the, it really hinges on what I do is is try to advocate and for different response options and help with contingency planning and help with decision making during an oil spill and different response options. And so having accurate information on the effects of, of oil and how those effects might be changed as we go down the path of different response options is really uh, critically important. And you guys, you said some of the some of the kind of points that you brought up were kind of key things that I scratch my head about and issues that I discuss as I communicate this this issue of advocating for oil spill response and helping with contingency planning. I mean, uh, Jeff, your your comments about Murfingus and you know this this there's always a big a big rush for new folks, which is great to get into the to the oil spill business, but they rush in maybe without doing the literature reviews. That they need to do that's a that's kind of a perennial issue that we we find and i'm not sure how it's how it can be resolved um but i you know i remember right off the deep water horizon the first one of the first big papers that came out and then the media jumps all over it that dispersants made the oil 52 times more toxic and I, when that when i get when that gets in the media i get emails from vice presidents and presidents of exxon mobile asking me wait you told me just the opposite and then a year later, I go to the next Gomery conference, and and the and that threshold was beat by an order of magnitude as the oil is two thousand times more toxic in the next time. And it's this it's some of the issues you discussed about using nominal concentrations versus you know versus actual concentrations that the oil organisms are exposed are exposed to. So I think you I think you've I think this version of oil and sea is is really advanced some of these challenges that we've seen on on interpreting these findings. Um, one of the things that I'm I find challenging is this, you know, the lab versus field. And I, I guess I want to ask you guys' opinion on this. Lab versus field is something that we that I, I see as a big issue, and it has been a big issue for a long time. And I see that I think you're you're clarifying those challenges more. I've always thought before Deepwater Horizon even that you know, giving a responder, you know, my goal is to help the response. Um, choose the, res the tactical response that are going to reduce the impacts on the environment, allow the environment to recover as quickly as possible. And the, dis the decision makers can do nothing with a lot of the information that's based on lab studies, right? An LC50 does nothing to tell. And so what, what the focus, I think, more lab studies maybe are fine, but the focus needs to be to elevate to models that predict ecosystem and population impacts, right? I can go in and say, if you do this response strategy, here's what the here's how the ecosystem reacts. And if you use this response strategy, here's how the ecosystem will react. That's the kind of information that's 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 needed for for decision making and not, you know, not a lab, here's a lab study on what we found. Um, that doesn't really that really almost confuses things in in my opinion. So one of the things regarding lab studies is is the challenge. And I'm wondering how deep how strongly the report describes this and my my challenge what i believe is a lab study extrapolating results of a lab toxicity study to the field is 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 a fool there and kind of thing and, and the big challenge is the you have liquid droplets or a liquid phase in a closed system with a dissolved phase and so that forces an equilibrium to happen Right, and an equilibrium equilibrium doesn't happen in the field in an open environment. And so, when you expose organisms in a beaker to equilibrium conditions, as soon as a molecule that might be toxic to them gets absorbed into their onto their gills, onto their body, onto the wall of the system, or wherever, or gets biodegraded, or whatever happens to it, well, the liquid droplet shoots out another one of those guys to maintain equilibrium. Right, so. So the exposure conditions are far greater for those organisms in a closed system than they could be exposed to in, a, in an open system. So what, what, what we've been trying to, to communicate is that lab studies certainly have their place and they shouldn't be because they because we can carefully control the conditions in a lab study. We can carefully control 
understand what the exposure conditions are in our lab study. So lab studies should be used to calibrate models, and then models should be used to predict effects concentrations in the field, because a model can simulate actual exposure conditions in the field. And then uh, the, the lab study is used to calibrate and, and validate and validate those models. Does the, does the report, or what's your guys' opinion on that, number one, and does the report discuss the that disconnect, I guess, between the, I, you mentioned it, but the disconnect and how to resolve the disconnect between lab exposures and actual field exposures. I guess it's a long-winded question there, but any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, no, the report does go into that um, and, and discuss that as, as you already answered the, 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 the question, <laughs> as essentially, I mean, the, the, the lab studies, you know, certainly do have their place in terms of, um, you know, calibrating and, and um, even, you know, uh, potentially validating models, as does, um, you know, field uh, field data. Um, but it really, it really depends on knowing what you've done and what that actually means in terms of your study design. So, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, reaching equi equilibrium in a closed system. You know, there are other approaches where you can have a flow through system um and uh, you know you don't have to have static e exposures per se um you know there, there's so many different ways of conducting exposure um s s scenarios um in the lab but you know standard toxicity tests are restrictive i mean not just in terms of um even even timing um and uh, you know an oil spill is is dynamic in in space and time and quite often a number of these tox toxicity tests you know, are, are looking at time spans that you know, might not be applicable to, to the field. So there's so many different nuances um, here. So the, the report does discuss those, but does talk about, um, you know, the, the, what you can do to, um, you know, make these tests more appropriate for use, particularly for, um, you know, calibrating models. They really shouldn't be, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, um, What's the word surrogates or, or telling you what's happening in that spill in that environmental you know they are tools to use to um uh to, to help calibrate uh to models and also to have an idea at mechanisms of action um that's the other thing that they that they can do is like you know identify well you know what what species might be impacted impacted and, and why um so jeff did you have any other comments on that um yeah i think just from a higher Kind of somewhat higher level perspective, and 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 Tim, I'm really glad you raised that that question. Um, and it's one I've thought about a lot for a long time too. Is that in general, I you know I think the purpose of laboratory tests is to give you a an idea of what can happen, but but not often enough do the investigators themselves or the editors of the papers uh, insist on well, yeah, okay. It, this maybe can happen. Uh, what's the likelihood, or how could it? How how much would it happen uh, in a field setting? And and I think I think putting more of an onus on the research community to uh, consider those points uh, for people who are doing lab lab based studies to discuss critically how uh, how widespread this effect could be, how important it could be. You know, scientists are famous for um, thinking that that their work is far more important than it actually turns out to be in, in most cases. And I'm certainly guilty of that myself. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Um, so so uh, I guess that, that would be my, my main re reaction to that. But I'm really glad you brought it up. All right. Well, let me ask one more question. We have a question up here, and I'll go to that in a in a set after this one. But so, Dr. Short, you you talked about how the fish how the fishing the 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 mortality of seabirds uh, challenged the ecosystem because it eliminated or reduced the pressure on these forage fish, and so their populations expanded, and then that had a cascading effect down the up the food chain. But I'm wondering. What's more important, the six months moratorium, this is the Deepwater Horizon specifically, the six months moratorium on fishing um, that allowed those Menhaden populations to, you know, explode, in my opinion, um, is, is the, are fishermen more adept at catching Menhaden or are fish more adept at catching Menhaden? So is there a combination there that 
the moratorium on fishing had to have been uh, something that the Menhaden community celebrated, I think. Um, but but our birds are, are is the amount of Menhaden caught by birds equivalent, greater, less than than the amount of Menhaden caught by fishermen who Menhaden the biggest catch in the uh, yeah. big fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. Right, right. Well, um, the uh, uh, the papers supporting that picture go into that question in considerable detail. Uh, and and the basic uh, answer is that the moratorium affected uh, what the, the Deepwater Horizon happened in the spring of 2009, right? Yeah. And the moratorium was over the uh, over the summer, uh, and so the uh, effect of uh, the moratorium was on the adults, the fishable population, which had already spawned. Uh, <clears throat> by the time uh, the uh, uh, to a large, in, almost entirely had already spawned, they spawned during the winter, and so you would expect uh, an effect, if any, from fishing to show up uh, a year later than it actually did. Uh, whereas killing those birds happened right away, and that affected the 2009 year class uh, because they feed primarily on juveniles. And so it was increasing juvenile survival um, that led to uh, a huge increase in the adult population the following year. So the timing doesn't really support a large role for commercial fishing compared to the, the effect of the okay. birds. Okay, well, no, good answer. Um, well, let me go. So listen, uh, we're, we have the question and answer open. If there's, we have a couple more minutes maybe, but I have one question. Maybe this question is gonna take us to the half hour. And we, yeah, but let me let me ask this question. So we have a question and I keep the questioners anonymous um, for reasons that are beyond my control, I guess. But the question, the, there's a comment here, dynamic duo, extremely wonderful presentation, summarizing the contents of chapter six. What do you discuss further? Number one, positive effects of oil around natural seeps. That's one, two. When to use natural attenuation or when to be more intrusive in removal techniques with an eye toward minimizing environmental impact. And three, any outstanding differences in Arctic versus temperate impact concerns. So any any comments, thoughts on, on those? I, I, I can make a comment on what we we, we mentioned in our um, conclusions and, and, and findings um, for regarding the oil or, or, or the natural seeps. Um, you know, it, keep in mind that these natural seeps are areas of you know particularly yeah. unique um, biological communities, um, and they you know they evolved to use oil as um, an energy and nutrient source. So you know these are unique you know, communities that we can, you know, learn a lot from in terms of, you know, even oil degrade, oil degradation pathways. They have unique, you know, bio, bio ge geochemical pathways that um, we, we can understand. So, you know, th they support all sorts of biogeochemical processes um, that, you know, we, we really could, we don't understand and and they could be um you know really useful um in knowing further forward so that that was the, that was the just the comment on on the on the natural seeps and you know how we could use those and have positive benefits in terms of understanding oil degradation and um you know looking at these unique communities Dr. short uh well I'll uh, um you know second that <laughs> what Garris just 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 mentioned, uh, um, and just you know, another thing that natural seeds do is is there a, is there a carbon source uh, for for um, the impact the receiving environment, um, and they um, oh what was I lost my thread there um, oh there 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 um, the difference between a natural seed and a, and a you know, a more instantaneous event like a like an oil spill is in rate of change of the environment. Where so the, the receiving environment and the ecosystem has uh, time to adapt to a seep, uh, and and does so. Whereas when you have a spill, it's into uh, an environment that's largely naive with respect to oil pollution. So that's a big difference. Uh, with respect to natural attenuation, um, you know, I, I do. <laughs> 
I I think that um, it, it's wise to rely on natural attenuation to the extent that you you possibly can to kind of prioritize that as a first first response, and, uh, more of a first go to response than than an intrusive tech. Uh, uh, removal technique, um, with the exception of the uh, use of dispersants at sea, uh, provided you can apply those dispersants effectively. Um, you know the, the the rationale that I endorse for the use of dispersants, and, and Tim, you know about this way more than I do, but um, <clears throat> it is uh, it keeping keeping oil from hitting the shoreline, and that's that's to avoid that. Uh, you know, compression effect where oil will pile up if it hits the shoreline and once it gets there it'll stay there for a long time possibly so out in the open water i think i think dispersants can make sense provided you get there under conditions which will allow them to be effective but if those conditions aren't present then then i'm not sure that it's uh, uh that great of an idea um well, great. That's a good. That's a good thing. Deb. I, your comments about dimensionality is that's the that's the exact same argument I use uh, quite a bit. I my first. I'm an environmental engineer. The first course I took was dilution is not the the first lecture described how dilution is not the solution to pollution, but in an emergency it is right. And and yeah. and the, the three dimensions of the water column in an open environment, right? Not a not a cove or a marina. Or a harbor, but in the uh, offshore, the three dimension it needs to be used to your advantage, and that's what dispersants do. It allows solution in three dimensions from an emergency kind of impact, and and if you allow oil to come up to the surface, it concentrates in two dimensions, and it has all these impacts to these high level organisms that have long term recoveries. Right, they don't breed quickly, and then allowing the oil to come to shorelines, it concentrates in one dimension. So I use that argument all the time. I'm glad to see that that, that you were. That you were using that you were using that argument. All right. Well, we're a little past. Um, okay, I have one more thing to okay. add, just quickly to uh, the uh, third third comment there on, under that person uh, about the differences between the Arctic and uh, and temperate climates. And and I, I uh, from what I've seen and, and living close to an Arctic uh, environment myself, um, the uh, temperature differences are are less significant. Uh, than many people suppose as far as uh, having an effect on biodegradation rates. Um, nutrients and oxygen availability are much more important uh, than, than cooler temperatures in uh, modulating uh, uh, oil biodegradation uh, in the Arctic. Apart from that, um, most of the processes that occur in temperate environments uh, occur in the Arctic too. Yes. Well, that's a, you know we did a project before Deepwater Horizon to look at biodegradation and toxicity in the Arctic, and I think we think came up with those conclusions. Organisms that set up shop to do their business in the Arctic have developed mechanisms for exploiting yep. um, the nutrients and, and food sources that they have in those in those environments. So that's that's another kind of talking point that we that we discussed related to the Arctic. Um, well, listen, we're past time here. There's some people that have stayed on, and I appreciate. I appreciate that. I want to thank you guys. I know you guys probably spent as much time as anybody putting together these slides. This to me was one of the best talks because the effects of oil in the sea is, is really the heart of the issue here. And, and, and what we can do to, to modulate those effects is really key, but you've got to understand the effects so you can understand what, what, how you can modulate those effects. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time doing this. Again, this was a really interesting talk for me. Um, so those who are still on, we have our next talk, as we talked about at the beginning, but Dr. Bernie Goldstein is going to talk on health effects, human health effects of oil in the sea, and that talk will be on November 7th. That may be, well, that will be, I think that's the last talk we have on this NASM series, and uh, we're, we'll, we're debating internally whether or not we're going to keep this going um, after this, keep this lecture series going after this series. I know there's a lot of other interesting speakers out there, so... Um, so it, it's kind of a question we're, we're debating internally right now, but uh, we have next, we, I think we'll go for certain, we'll go on until the end of this year and November 7th is, is the next one. So thank you guys again. And thanks to everyone else for, uh, for paying, for paying attention and, and tuning in.
and we'll see you next Thank time. You, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Tim. It's Ed. Hey, Ed. Uh, thanks. They, they did great. Yeah. Uh, I just really calling because um, I we we were scheduled December fifth for the last oil on the sea. We were going to do a panel discussion. Oh, okay. Uh, that hasn't so changed. That hasn't changed. I'm just a little confused because I okay haven't been paying attention as much because of those things going on this summer. So don't so okay. don't so don't worry, don't worry. No, I, I just wanted to know if I should. Stop, uh, all my activities on that or if it was happening. No, that's that's my fault. I uh, okay. I haven't been no I haven't been communicating with Lynn like I should because we've been both traveling no. a lot in the last few weeks. No, no, okay. Uh, no, everything's fine then. Uh, I just I like I said I don't want to prep for something that's not happening. Um. So great. Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah. No. I look. That's. As I said, I that's the most important stuff, right? How, what's the, that's why we do everything. Effects and how do we how do we modulate those effects? And so, I think, and I was, uh, I was, uh, gosh, well, I'm having trouble with my Zoom. I was a little uncertain about those the messages, those two, because because they are, uh, you know, I've seen some of the stuff that they've said, and. Uh, but they, I would have said the exact same things they did. They didn't. And then that last comment of Dr. Short that this person, you know, if we can actually get them to work offshore and keep the oil off the surface and off the water column, that's that's kind of message I. That's good there, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So. so. Okay. All right. Well, sorry for the confusion, but yeah, we are. Yeah, we'll clear that. I just again, because we're starting to put together the, you know, we have. I think we have six people who are going to come on with us. So. Yeah. Um, I just didn't want to make. I didn't want everybody doing stuff and then saying, uh, "Oh, we're not, we're not really doing that." Cool. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Tim. All right. Thanks for calling. Talk to you later. Yeah, bye. -bye.